going to talk about apples. Apples. I like apples. Any one of you who like apples? Good. So we're going to talk about apples today. The other day, my wife asked me to get some fruits and uh, as I was looking around, I got some apples. But as I was looking at many other fruits, I noticed that there were so many apples. Actually, I didn't realize that we have so many apples. And um, in fact, let me ask you a question. How many types of apples do you think exist? Yes. Three? Well, let me read for you some of the apples that I find. There are those that they call Red Delicious, Gala, Fuji, Granny Smith. In fact, I have here, these are 15 different types of apples that I was able to find. In, when I went to different stores, I was actually able to name 18 different types of apples. Macintosh, Golden Delicious, Crispy Pink, Honey Crispy, Pacific Rose, Polar Red, Wealthy, um, Envy. Look at all these types of apples. I wasn't aware of that. Well, I also noticed that there are actually many types of products you can make from all these different apples. For example, you can make things like apple juice. Apple juice. What are the things that you can make from apples? Apple pies. Well, apple pies. Apple sauce. Apple sauce. What are the things that you can make from apples? Um, apple pizza. Good, good, good. But, well, apple cider, apple cider. Yeah, apple cider. Well, there are also you can make um, apple m muffins, and you can make um, yes. What else? Candy apple. 
Apple vinegar. Apple vinegar, yes. Now, here, listen to me now. So we talked about how many types, how many types of apples? About 18 different types of apples. Now, if you look, there are different colors, different shapes. But you know what? If you want to make apple pie, did you realize that you cannot just use any types of apple? There are specific apples that you use when you want to make apple pies. There are specific apples that you use when you want to make apple juice. You just don't use any types of apple. In fact, for example, when you want to make an apple pie, Granny Smith apple is the one you use. I didn't know that. You just can't make or use Granny Smith apple to make apple juice. I didn't know that. But something came to mind and said, well, you know what? You if you look at all these types of apples, some different colors, some small, some big, just look around you. I want you just, just look around, around you. Turn on the left, turn on the right, look at the, your neighbor next to you. You are all what? Different. Some of you, you have straight hair, some you have not straight hair, some you are small, some you... Just as these apples look like, you all have different gift that God has given you. And just as you cannot use a Granny Smith apple to make a juice, the same way, you know, the gifts that God has given you, they are for specific purposes. And so when you use those gifts for the specific purposes that God has given you those gifts for, you will become what? Happy and in fact, God looks at you when he gave you those gifts. You are the apple of my eyes. That's what God looks at you because God cares for you. Now, you may have heard about people use the word apple of my eyes. In the Bible, Proverbs, 7, Proverbs chapter 7, verse 2, and in fact, in Psalm 17, 8, you have these, again, references where you are considered God's Apples, I. That means you are special. And so when God gave you those gifts, it's for, so that you use those gifts for the purpose of give, doing what? Glorifying Him. So now you are what? The apple of God's eye. That means you are what? Special in His eyes. So that's the message for today. So, let's see who is going to pray. Um, buy our heads and close your eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Help us to be obedient. Help us to do your word and help us to be not disobedient. Help us to listen to our teachers at school. Help us to play friendly. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. 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 So now let's walk back quietly. And you remember that you are God's apples, our eyes very special in his sight.
Good morning, church. We all know that the pastor has been speaking about the month of October. He's been elaborating on it over and over and over again, actually. Um, October is also a very special month for us because our grandfather, which passed away earlier this year, um, would have been 98 on Tuesday. So that's another very special day, October 23rd um, in October. So um, Grandpa, when he was um, working, he worked many years as a carpenter, and he consistently showed us a couple of keys to living a long and healthy life. One of them was that he was always outside. Even towards the end of his life, he would request to sit in the sun. Um, And one of the good things about sunlight are when sunlight hits the skin, it triggers the body's production of vitamin D, which protects against inflammation, it lowers blood pressure, helps muscles, improves brain function, and may even protect against cancer. Another thing that we noticed about Grandpa was that he never overate. And I think we heard that last week from David with young kids as well, right? They never overeat. And one thing that this practice does, it causes you to feel lighter and also more energetic. And your body isn't spending as much time digesting food that it doesn't need and also storing fat, especially right before going to bed. So we just want to encourage us, all of us, to just think about eating lighter, especially at night, and also resting well. And we want to keep these things in mind throughout this week. Also, since the 22nd, I'm sure that the pastor is referring to, uh, make sure that he does not overeat on that day. Make sure that he keeps his meals to a minimum. Just because it's his birthday doesn't mean that he gets to splurge. We all know that he's trying to get in shape. So that's what we want to leave for you today. Have a good Sabbath.
Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, the wee hours of this morning, you and I had a conversation about this moment. Speak now, Lord, for thy servant is listening. In Jesus' name, let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. amen. Say amen again. I must say that I'm not sure why the health ministries department decided to pick on me today. <laughs> I wasn't the one uh, eating apples in church. <laughs> in between meals, by the way. <laughs> but we are blessed and we are thankful uh, for how God uses us all in his service. Amen? I lift up before you today verse 14, the 17th chapter of an Old Testament book we refer to as First Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and uh, verse 14, the Bible says, And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went in return from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. Jesse said unto, unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand. And look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight, shouted and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. I've entitled this very embattled, euphoric, eschatological pericope going rogue on a pizza delivery. It's very fitting that we talk about David today. What a blessing it is to have such a great character in Scripture. Amen. Uh, it is an incredible story about a young man who was called from a young age to stand for the host of the living God. I want to posit to you today that it doesn't matter how old you are when it comes to serving God. Some of us like to forget, but Jesus himself was a very young man that turned the world upside down. Many of the great leaders that have changed uh, the world's history forever were very young men. One of them even in uh, the great Martin Luther King, a very young man in his 20s turning uh, the world upside down. It's incredible to see that God can use anybody at any time. It uh, doesn't matter how young you are, God can uh, use you. And for my seniors, it doesn't matter how old you are, you also find examples in Scripture that God can use anybody. It's interesting because David is the younger brother, and uh, he has stayed at home at Jesse's house to do 
if you would, the home chores. Uh, he's home uh, taking care of everything uh, in regards to the house. On the other side, though, there are three brothers, the oldest of them alive, that are actually enlisted. They've been conscripted to Saul's army to fight against the Philistines. It's amazing because the Philistines always seem to be popping up and they keep causing trouble for the nation of Israel. And they are out there and this time though it is a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's a little different this time because they have gathered at the valley of Elah and uh, they are there and instead of them just fighting it out, the Philistines come up with a genius idea that they will send uh, their greatest warrior out to fight for them. I need to pause here just for a second that one of the things that Israel is lacking greatly in this story is courage and faith in the God they serve. Uh, they should have understood that it didn't matter who the Philistines brought forth. They served the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Uh, they served the captain of the Lord's host. Uh, how dare you be afraid uh, of anything that comes up against you when the Lord is on your side? The Bible says if God is for us, who can be against us? How dare you walk around with trepidation when you just prayed this morning for God to be with you? If you believe that he's with you, then walk with some confidence that God is on your side and that no weapon that's formed against you will prosper. Learn to trust in the merits of God, that God is good enough, that he's big enough, Enough and that he's strong enough to see you through. Uh, it's an amazing thing because he's there and uh, this story is incredible because Goliath comes out and he steps out on the plane. It's amazing because if you would, there's a valley in between. And as we know, there can be no valleys uh, without any mountains. And so on one side, uh, there is the Philistines on this mountain. And on the other side, uh, there is the mountain where the Israelites are dwelling. And Goliath comes out. And for 40 days, he says, send me somebody to fight me. It doesn't make sense for us to have a bunch of casualties for this war. You send your best man and I'll stand here and I will fight him. Whoever wins, wins the whole war. Our friends, I need you to understand one of the reasons why this pericope is so eschatological is because you need to understand that this battle has never been about us. It's always been between God and Satan. You need to understand that you're just small peas in the pod. That if you just learn to trust in God, you will realize one thing really, really fast. That the battle is already over. Oh, he won it on Calvary's cross. He stretched his arms wide and he died for you and I so that we don't have to fight. Understand, if you're fighting, you're not minding your own business. It's not your duty to fight. The battle's already been won. God has already secured victory for you and I. All we need to do is learn to enjoy the victorious celebration. Uh, when trouble comes, uh, understand that it can't last forever because God has already won. Uh, somehow it's going to work out because all things uh, work together for good. Uh, to them who are what, church? Come on now, are you called by God? Uh, did God call you into church today? Then how about trusting him uh, to handle the problems in your life? Understand, the devil always has a Goliath to send into your life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always got a Goliath uh, to try and come and intimidate you in your Christian walk. It's amazing because he's out there and he's hollering and everybody can hear him. Huh? Because of course the valley gives him, if you would, a big microphone to just shout whatever he wants. And it's echoing all over the mountain. <laughs> Send me a man, a man, a man, a man. <laughs> Send me somebody, somebody, somebody. That's all you're hearing. And no Israelite will step up. 
Now, before we get to David, it's important to realize that, yes, Goliath is a big man, standing about 10 feet tall, got all kinds of armor. Some of his shield looked like, looked like, like, like fish scales. They were so huge. Uh, he's standing out there to the extent that his armor is so huge and so big that it literally covers almost every inch of his body. There are no ways to really get to him. The beams that he's carrying on top of his spear, the, the javelin that's on his back weighs more than David. David doesn't stand a chance, but, but, the, but the whole nation of Israel is afraid to go out and fight him. Now, again, before we get to David, we got to deal with Saul. Isn't it so that when he was called to be king, the Bible says he stood head and shoulders above everybody? If there's anybody that should have courage to fight Goliath, it's Saul. But Saul's been too busy talking to the underworld. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us. Saul uh, has given up his right to be king. Saul has given it up. He's no longer God's chosen man. And so now, uh, in the midst of adversity, instead of him having courage, he's afraid. He's scared. Saul is shaking in his boots. Won't go fight. Ain't got nobody to fight. And for 40 days, Goliath runs his mouth. It's very interesting because 40 days is no ordinary number in scripture we understand that the flood came for 40 days and for 40 nights we understand Jesus went out into the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights we understand that Moses went up into the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights and when he came down and through God's commandments down God sent him back up in the mountain for 40 days and and for 40 nights, understand 40 is a number that God moves on. I got some friends, we're all right around 40. Come on, somebody ought to say amen. Huh? And the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, is that this is a number that God likes to show himself. How does he do it? He goes and finds a ruddy young boy. Very good looking. David was a very good-looking young man. Ah, oh, come on, somebody, somebody ought to say amen, huh? Say praise the Lord, huh? Huh? He's a good-looking young man, and here's what's interesting: is that is that his dad sends him not to go and fight, but to go and deliver some goods. Uh, come on now. Uh, go, go, go and take your brothers. I ain't heard from them in a while. Go check on how they're doing. I want you to take some bread, if you would. I want you to take some parched corn. I don't want you to take some cheese. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. Uh, uh, there are some that in their existence worked at four star just for a little bit. Uh, you understand what it means to make some dough, huh? You got the little, the little crumbled corn that you put a little dust around the edges, huh? And you got to put some cheese on top. Uh, David is on a pizza delivery uh, for his brothers. He's there and he's on his way to deliver. And, and when he gets there, he drops off the pizza. He he greets his brothers, but then he just happens to show up when Goliath is running his mouth. Mm. He hears, uh, send me somebody to fight me. Ellen White says David is actually looking through the ranks, wondering why somebody hasn't moved to go and fight him. Uh, he can't understand uh, why no one in all the camp of Israel has the courage to go and fight Goliath. Uh, how is it that nobody wants to go and take him on? Uh, he's looking and he's looking and he's looking. Finally, 
he opens up his mouth and says, why isn't anybody ready to fight this uncircumcised Philistine? He's not just a Philistine. The boy ain't even circumcised. How dare you be afraid of somebody that has boldly said they're with the enemy when the Lord is on our side? Oh, it's an amazing story because at this moment, at this moment, his brother chastises him because David always was aggressive. He weren't afraid of nobody. Let me look around here. Just <laughs> David was afraid of nobody. Oh, come on, somebody. Um, the truth of the matter is uh, he was always ready to take on every challenge. Born that way, came out the wound that way, ready to tackle anything. And he makes his way. He says, look, man, and because the lab is really getting on this case, look, look, take all that little nonsense you do back in the farm, back to the farm. Don't come over here running your mouth. This is a real war over here. And David says to his brother, am I angry without cause? Isn't there something worth fighting for here? Isn't there something to be dealt with here? This uncircumcised Philistine is defying the Lord's host. We've got to do something about it. Now, the argument is heard by others, and word gets back to Saul that there's a young fella that's ready to fight. Oh, Lord. Saul says, bring him in here. And David comes in there, and, and, and Saul feels like he needs to give David uh, an interview before he goes to fight. Uh, young man, what is your expertise in fighting? Uh, he asked the wrong one. David said, uh, well, I got a couple of real good examples on my resume. Uh, on a regular basis, I take down lions and I take down bears. Oh, he says, listen, and the same God that gave me the lion in my hand and gave me the bear in my hand will give me this uncircumcised Philistine. Send me in there to fight. It's an amazing thing. David says, when I used to fight him, because it's amazing, back then it was normal. It was a normal part of being a shepherd that lions and bears would come and try to attack the sheep. It was your job to protect the sheep. That was your duty. And many times David said, not only would I take them out, but when they had come up against me, David said he would grab the lion, grab the bear by their beard. There are some of you that won't even go close to the lion's cage. But, but David grabbed the lion's beard and said he would just punch him right. Oh, come on now. Smote him right in the face. This is David, a young boy who's not afraid of lions and bears. I can take a lion. I can take a bear, which means this Goliath doesn't stand a chance. I need to pause here just for a second. Let me just pause parenthetically because I need you to understand that your past victories that God has given you in your life uh, ought to be the stepping stones for your present trouble. Uh, you ought to understand uh, that if God did it for you in the past, uh, that he can do it for you again today. Uh, have some courage uh, in the God that delivered you five years ago, the God that delivered you last week, and trust that he can do it again. Oh, it's an amazing story because... At this point, Saul tries to get credit for what he's afraid to do. Young fella, if you're going to fight, at least use my armor. Oh. David puts it on, clanking all over the place. Listen, man, based on my resume... This don't work against lions. Uh, this don't work against bears. But understand this. You can't fight the devil wearing the devil's armor. Oh, Jesus. If we're going to take him out, 
We need the Lord's armor, uh, which is not swords and, and shields. No, 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 no. David says some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Our victory doesn't come in what we wear, but whose side we're on. It doesn't come in what our armor is uh, but it comes when we are clothed in righteousness uh, changed by grace uh, spared by mercy when God is with us there is nobody that can stop us oh, it's amazing because David takes that off and what he takes instead he picks up his rod and his staff huh, and his sling because that's what he's used to fighting with Understand that a shepherd always has a rod and a staff. Oh, Lord. He takes his staff with him. Very important. He takes his rod. Rod is primarily for correction. Okay? Smack the sheep around. Get in line. Get where you're supposed to be. Sheep are dumb. They don't have a clue. So you got to smack them around. Okay? So they end up smacking them around. Get in line. Stay together. All that kind of stuff. But the staff is a little different. You see, the staff signified that the shepherd was around. Oh. Sometimes the shepherd might have to go to the restroom or go around the corner to do something. And so what he would do is, while the sheep were still gathered and eating, he knew eventually they would look up looking for him while he was gone. So what he would do is he would lean his staff against an object, against a tree, whatever it might be. So that when they turned around and they saw the staff, they knew he was close by and they would go back to eating or doing what they were supposed to be doing. It's very interesting uh, that God has placed way marks in our life uh, to constantly remind us that he's always there. You don't have to worry. Uh, just look around. Uh, he woke you up this morning. Uh, he put food on your table. Uh, he made sure you had a job to go to. Uh, somehow in this crazy economy, he keeps money in your pocket. Uh, we can't quite understand it. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that there is evidence all around us that God is with us every single day. How dare we doubt him uh, that he's not going to show up when he's always there. It's incredible because David comes with that staff to let Israel know that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob is with us. And he comes out there and he comes before Goliath, and now Goliath gets really angry. How dare you send me this little boy with his little sticks and stones to fight me? <laughs> uh, kids often say, sticks and stones may break my bones. My words will never hurt me. One of the biggest lies ever told. <laughs> Yes, words do hurt. And the boy is saying some words that gets him in trouble. It's because of Goliath's big mouth that David is going to fight in the first place. Because his words are offensive to David. And I'm saying to you today that people may say a lot of things. But when they speak a word against the living God that you serve, there ought to be a righteous indignation that rises up in you. Because you know that without God, you are nothing can't sit around and let people tell you that God doesn't exist. You can't let them tell you uh, that he's just a figment of your imagination. Uh, there is evidence all around you uh, that God does exist. Hmm. Uh, in this room, we got a good 400 people. That's 400 testimonies uh, of what God can do uh, when he comes into somebody's life. Mm, what am I talking about? I'm saying that, you know, I was, I was there the other day, I was at the barbershop and we get into these arguments all the time and I, a guy said to me, well, uh, God doesn't exist. I said, he doesn't? And I always go back to the same arm. I said, does China exist? He said, yes. He said, but you ain't never seen God. I said, you've never seen China. <laughs> huh? I said, how do you know China exists? My school teacher told me. He said, that's one. I said, who else told you? I've heard, I've seen it on TV. 
I said, man, you got two sources. <laughs> I got millions and billions of people huh, that will testify you to today uh, that God is alive, uh, that he's on the throne, uh, that he changed my life. Uh, how is it that you can believe the two while you ignore the millions that have been changed by God's transforming love? It's an amazing thing because people would rather believe a lie in this day than to believe the truth. And that is the error that we have entered into. And David comes. And Goliath is talking smack. And Goliath said, boy, I'm going to feed you to the birds. <laughs> feed you to the birds. And David comes right back. Goliath says, I'm going to do it. David says, I come to you. In the name of the Lord of hosts. Oh, understand, he understands uh, that the battle is not his. It's the Lord's. And somehow, some way, God is going to give him the victory. You may not know exactly how God is going to sort it out, but what you should be certain of is that victory is always certain for the people of God when they place their life in the master's hand. It's an amazing thing because it's this battle and Ellen White lets us know that, 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 that in this battle, as they're getting angry, Goliath gets a little fired up to the extent he's sick and tired that he actually tips his helmet back. Oh, Lord. Just enough. <laughs> Oh, just enough. You got to understand this is David. When he's fighting the lion, he don't have too much time. He's got to move quickly. Uh, when he's fighting the bear, the bear could just hit him once and he's dead. Uh, he has to move quickly. David sees just a little spot that he needs. And he reaches down into his sling, uh, takes that stone and puts it in there, and he gets to running. Uh, the Bible says he doesn't walk to Goliath, uh, but he runs to Goliath. Uh, David's not afraid of Goliath. Uh, David understands that the victory is already won. Uh, he's running to him. Now, hold on a second. This is a valley. So David has followed the health message. Uh, he didn't eat late on his birthday. Oh, come on, somebody. And he's running uh, up the hill. Uh, come on, some of you can't walk up a hill. The boy is running up the hill to take on Goliath. He sees the little spot, and while he's running, he's spinning. Uh, while he's running, he's slinging. Uh, while he's running, he has all confidence uh, that it doesn't really matter whether or not he throws the rock correctly. Uh, he's got angels. Uh, that excel in strength uh, that will guide that stone uh, right between Goliath's eyes. Uh, he understands uh, that when God is with you, uh, there is nobody that can come against you. He hurls the stone and in the only vulnerable spot that Goliath has, the stone buries right in here. Huh? Alan said he staggered a little bit. <laughs> he wobbled a little bit. And then all that armor came clanking to the ground. Goliath had said, I'm going to cut your head off. David said, really? <laughs> and David goes, little David, standing on top of Goliath with a sword in his hand and chops Goliath's big head off picks it up by the hair to show the army of Israel that when God is on your side, there is nothing that he won't do for you. At that moment, they come running off the mountain. Now they're ready to fight. And I want to posit to you that when you have faith to trust in God, it invigorates everybody else around you to believe in him too. Understand that if you can just have just that little spark of faith that your whole family will believe. Your relatives will believe because you believe. It's amazing because later on David will go on to become the greatest king that Israel has ever seen. All because he learned from a very young age, that when God is for us, who can be against us? Who says amen to God's word today? Your head's about, your head's about, your eyes are closed. Because 
a day is going to come in your life when you're going to have to go rogue on an ordinary mission. You see, God, when you're working for him, sends you down paths that are unexpected. But understand this, family. He would never send you if he had not already prepared you. Your heads about your eyes are closed because the truth is, instead of trusting in God, some of us have tried to wear Saul's armor. Some of us have tried to put on the devil's armor to fight the Lord's victories. And it's impossible to win until you are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I'm just wondering today, is there somebody out there that says, today, Pastor, I choose to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. For without Him, I am nothing. Without Him, it's impossible for me to make it. So while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if that is you, just say today, God, clothe me with your righteousness that I might be victorious in this life. If that's you, just stand. Just stand wherever you are. Wherever you are, just stand. I want to be clothed. God bless you. God bless you. I want to be clothed. I'm clothed. I'm, I'm tired of fighting it on my own. I'm tired of fighting it on my own. I fight and I fight and I lose and I lose. I've tried tactics. I've tried fighting. I've tried art. I've tried everything you can imagine and I keep losing. Today I want to try Jesus Christ. Today I want to give my heart to him in a way that I haven't done before. I want him to be in charge. But then there's always somebody here that just comes to church to give their heart to Jesus Christ. Before they left the home, they knew they needed to come and give their heart to Jesus Christ. If that is you, I invite you to raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand. If you know you need to just surrender your all to Jesus Christ. God bless you, my brother. We got a Bible worker come and help him out. Can the church say amen for him? He just wants to give his heart to Jesus Christ. Is there another? Is that you too, sis? Come on, Sister Dillis. This lovely lady in the right in front of you. Yes, right in front of you. Is there somebody else? So raise their hand. We're going to send the Bible workers to you today. We're not going to make you come. But if there's, if there's somebody else, this lady raised her hand right there. Yes. Is there somebody else who just wants to say, I want Jesus to have my heart. God bless you.